I'm Aaron Dykes. This is the InfoWars Nightly News. Today is Wednesday, April 18th, 2012. Tonight, the Alex Jones exclusive interview with U.S. Senator Rand Paul as they discuss the expansion of the TSA and the constitutional violations of the Obama administration. Then, Oklahoma City bombing eyewitness joins Alex via video Skype as she reveals that she witnessed men in general service administration uniforms that were in the Murrah Federal Building before the false flag attack. A bombshell interview with Jane Graham. Next, President Obama has an ambitious plan to take command of the oceans and with it, control over much of the nation's energy in a move that can only be described as the ultimate power grab to zone the high seas. Plus, Goldman Sachs rules the world. Is the Bank of England next? And did you know that the national debt under Obama has increased over $5 trillion and counting? All that plus more of today's top headlines as we now take you to the Texas Central Command Center deep behind enemy lines. And Aaron Dykes from the InfoWars studio in Austin, Texas. And as we turn now to our top story, let's keep in mind we have been sabotaged economically and the scales of inequality are beginning to reach a tipping point. Uh, tonight we have the $5 trillion man. Debt has increased under Obama by more than $5 trillion. You got to keep in mind that in the first 219 years of the republic, all the presidents through Bill Clinton, the total American debt uh, was only about $5 trillion. Then, through the George W. Bush administration, we saw another $5 trillion or so tacked on, and now Obama has tacked on an additional $5 trillion plus just in his first three and a half years of office, not even counting what he may do if he reaches a second term. And you just see as they inflate the dollar, deflate the value, allow the banks to take over more and more, this is where we go as they build the socialist, communist, Soviet, fascist takeover government. It's just disgusting. Meanwhile, the House Investigative Committee is focusing on the GSA. I think that's a department a lot of people weren't even keeping tabs on or aware of, the General Services Administration, which does general things with spending government money, I would imagine. Anyway, they are under investigation on the Transportation and Infrastructure Subcommittee, and the public figures say they're in hot water and ready to dismantle the organization over the 823000 spent by 300 GSA officials during their luxury getaway in Las Vegas where they spent quite a bit on entertainment, I'm sure. I'm sure it's a big scandal, really bad, but they're covering up for all the other things going on. They're focusing on less than a million dollars when they're spending trillions and trillions and committing us to even more trillions. Remember, they already announced through the Federal Reserve government takeover that we're in the hole for more than 27 trillion. That's the the scale of commitments we have under the larger economic bailout, the things happening in Europe, the things happening here with the five big banks, which brings us to the fact that the two big to fail banks are now much bigger and more powerful than ever. That's according to the American Dream blog. The Democrats, the Republicans, and especially Barack Obama promised something would be done about the two big to fail banks. Well, what's been done? Those promises have not been kept. However, the banks are much more powerful than ever, whereas uh, at the beginning of the bailout, their total assets represented about 43% of total U.S. gross domestic product. They've now grown to having assets equal to about 56% of total U.S. GDP. And furthermore, the five big banks, which include J.P. Morgan Chase, Bank of America, Citigroup, Wells Fargo, and Goldman Sachs, are nearly twice as large as they were a decade ago. So you can see who's benefiting from the grand looting while we're distracted by the Obama presidency, by scandals in various government agencies, by celebrity news, on and on. They're just robbing and robbing and robbing. So what's happening in Europe? The takeover by Goldman Sachs is almost complete. Paul Joseph Watson has the report today. Goldman Sachs rules the world. The Bank of England next, and you've got Canadian Central Bank head Mark Carney uh, apparently about to head the centuries-old Bank of England. 
like the Federal Reserve, it is a private institution that helps to loot the British government subjects thereof, that is, as well as the rest of the world. And so it's seen as somewhat controversial that it's a Canadian set to be the first foreign head of the Bank of London, but A, he's a subject of the Queen anyway, and B, the Bank of London is foreign to what Britain stands for, even though the monarchy is not appealing either. The real controversy is that Goldman Sachs now has a number of very key positions inside the EU. Uh, taking over the Bank of London would just be another step. You've already got figures like Peter Sutherland, a uh, member of Goldman Sachs, as well as BP from Ireland. You've got people like Antonio Borges of France. You've got Mario Monti, the technocrat, the Bilderberger, the Trilateral Commission member, put unelected to head Italy. Uh, same thing with Papademos in Greece and a number of other people like Petros Christendalis. Uh, Mario Draghi is head of the EU Central Bank, so he's Europe at large, and you've got other figures in Belgium and Germany as well. Really just solidifying this terrible takeover as there's all this pressure for more and more bailouts with the smaller European countries as that gets more and more out of hand. Who is soaking up the power? Not the money, the power. Well, it's Goldman Sachs. We just told you that. Meanwhile, the ACTA Treaty is back in the news. Second MEP, second minister of the European Parliament, calls Internet Treaty a threat to liberties. And so a member of European Parliament who was appointed to oversee a controversial global Internet Treaty has called for the legislation to be scrapped just weeks after his predecessor. And so MEP David Martin replaces MEP Kader Arif as the EU reporter for ACTA inside the European Parliament. And David Martin, the new figure himself, said it poses, uh, it poses dangers to civil liberties and outweighs any benefits, which just adds to the long list of complaints from the previous reporter for ACTA, MEP Kader Arif, uh, who said, among other things, everyone knows the everyone knows the ACTA agreement is problematic, whether it is the impact on civil liberties or the way it makes internet access pri providers liable, or its consequences for generic drugs or for geographical indications and more. Now, of course, we have also warned this week and sounded the alarm on CISPA, the other dangerous new treaty to control the internet. And don't be fooled; they're going to keep changing the names a million times if they need to, because they cannot have a free web where you can criticize leaders and in an instant's notice draw criticism on the world account on the world agenda and so you also have to give a mandate to u.s cybercom so they could pass the cybersecurity agenda legitimize it and help further take over this country and so you've got headlines just from today cispo will improve u.s cybersecurity of course it will because they want the mandate as i mentioned Web inventor Tim Berners-Lee speaks out against CISPA, and CISPA is dangerously vague, and certainly these are all just power grabs to shut down the free web. We've warned you about that. Another dangerous power grab in the physical world, mandatory Big Brother black boxes in all new cars by the year 2015. There's another Paul Joseph Watson article. They've got a bill that has already passed the Senate and it's about to be, quote, rubber stamped through the House that would require all new cars in the U.S. to be fitted with black box data recorders from 2015 onwards. Just absolutely authoritarian. And they somehow claim that individual car owners would retain the rights to their data, but obviously it's set up so government agencies can get a hold of that data whenever they need it. And this is part of an ongoing quest for tyranny uh, in automobile and transportation. Things like OnStar and others have already de facto put trackers into the cars. Now they're just going to do it openly and at a full capacity. And of course, the push to pressure car manufacturers to install black box tracking devices has been ongoing for over a decade. You've heard Alex and others warning about it. The 2006 National Highway Traffic Safety Administration encouraged but did not require adding the system. So they're being put into cars you've already bought. But by 2015, if they pass this legislation, it will be completely mandatory. And as they build this Big Brother database system, this mark of the beast, even little things like having your inspection sticker out, whereas you might get a ticket now, you can get it taken care of 
uh, you have a little bit of window. Once you're in the system, not authorized for that or any other reason, your entire life is going to be shut down until you deal with their system. If they got warrants out for your arrest, they'll find you quickly, and you'll be doing jail time. Poor people who can't afford to pay some of these regulations will be doing jail time. It's just crazy. Another way the government is taking over our lives while completely looting the nation, transferring all economy to the bankers, and just making a joke of our country is through the National Oceans Council, another branch of that United Nations Agenda 21 takeover that they've had so much trouble passing. And it's just like the rural councils that Obama announced in 2010 with a long list of government agencies from the Department of Defense to Homeland Security and plenty of others in charge, supposedly, of all the nation's waterways. But that doesn't just mean water. That doesn't just mean coastlines. It includes rivers, lakes, streams. It also includes sources of water. So on the basis of snowfall, for example, they could be regulating mountain areas, environmental regions, on and on. It's all part of the larger sustainable development grab. And so from the Human Events article, Zoning the Ocean by Audrey Hudson, uh, she elaborates on Obama's executive order from 2010. President Obama has an ambitious plan for Washington bureaucrats to take command of the oceans and with it control over much of the nation's energy, fisheries, even recreation in a move described by lawmakers as the ultimate power grab over the zone of the seas. It's pure administrative fiat, Senator David Vitter said, and he's someone who uh, actually, despite his own controversies and lackings, has been on much of the scientific takeover agenda. I know he was early on questioning John P. Holdren, who happens to head this Oceans Council, on his genocidal quotes from the past and uh, other questions along these lines about these United Nations power grabs. So it goes on, the order says they shall develop a scheme for oversight of oceans and all the sources thereof. That is Representative Flores saying, so you could have a snowflake land on Pikes Peak and ultimately it's going to wind up in the water. As a result, they could regulate every square inch of U.S. soil because the water goes everywhere, the air goes everywhere. The United Nations wants to take over what they call the global commons because it knows no borders, no bounds. All people are subject to the basic elements of our planet. So if they can establish regulation over that, they've got us all. The article goes on. Critics of the revised plan say it's more narrowly focused and the Obama administration is taking their marching orders from environmental groups who want to move away from multiple use ocean policy to a no use policy. What have we always said about Agenda 21 is to restrict land, keep people move them away from the land so it's not usable, so it's zoned in a way that the land cannot be used. That's largely what this is about. Now, the National Oceans Council and this plan is still in draft form, and they're still simultaneously trying to pass the Law of the Sea Treaty, or LOST, as in Lost Sovereignty, which is the United Nations form of this treaty. It's still in draft form, but it still has called for over 150 milestones to be accomplished by next year, and they are in the process of implementing it. And so you look at the membership of the National Ocean Council, it's co-chaired by John P. Holdren, the notorious eugenicist, the genocidalist, who is basically the science czar under Obama. He's one of the authors of Ecoscience. You also have Nancy Sutley of the Council on Environmental Quality. But look at the rest of the list. It's the cabinet officials appointed by Obama and so forth and so on. Hillary Clinton, Secretary of State. Leon Panetta, Secretary of Defense. Ken Salazar, Secretary of the Interior, Tom Vilsack, Secretary of Agriculture, who's basically a front man just for Monsanto and company, Sibelius, Head of Health and Human Services, you got Commerce, Labor, Transportation, Energy, and on and on, including Janet Napolitano, Head of Homeland Security. This is exactly like the Rural Council. In this case, they're trying to establish a council or a Soviet or an unelected governorship over the waterways as they say similarly are trying to do over the rural areas, the farmlands, the non-metro districts. Let's cue that clip. And that they've also asked for the right to imprison farmers who wouldn't keep books as prescribed by the federal government. The Secretary of Agriculture asked for the right to seize farms through condemnation and resell them to other individuals. And contained in that same program was a provision that would have allowed the federal government to remove two million farmers from the soil. 
If you live in the heartland of America, you have to listen up. While the nation was distracted with the Anthony Weiner drama, President Obama signed an executive order that will seize greater power over food, fiber, and energy in our vast countryside areas. The president created the White House Rural Council to, quote, make sure we're working across government to strengthen rural communities and promote economic growth. Sounds great, but get this. The council involves a long list of the most powerful people in America. Treasury Secretary Tim Geithner, the Defense Secretary is on it, Attorney General Eric Holder, even the head of Homeland Security, Janet Napolitano. Why would Homeland Security be involved in exerting power and influence? And so here we have Cassandra Anderson's article for InfoWars. She also has her own blog at Morph City commenting on Obama's executive order 13547 passed in July of 2010. And as she points out in the article, it is basically the United Nations Law of the Sea Treaty, or LOST, as in lost sovereignty, but they couldn't get that passed. It's part of the larger Agenda 21, and so they're passing under executive fiat this total takeover of the waterways. And it's just important to note the degree to which they plan to take over everything. It's sickening. You saw what they're doing in the rural council, and here they have it again. It's all these Obama administration officials over everyone's life, unelected, just like the governor's board. The governors themselves were originally elected, but nobody... Uh, ordered the board of 10 governors who preside over the FEMA regions. And then similarly, they have the nation's waterways, the coastways, on and on, broken up into their own nine regions. The whole point here is they're trying to regionalize the United States, put it under regional control, sub-regions and the larger North American region, all under global governance with Dozens of agencies, like the ropes over Gilli um, Gulliver's Travels. The Lilliputians have rope after rope binding them down. Not one rope, lots of tiny ropes circling the globe, putting it under control gradually through all these different policies, through these different advisory panels, through these Soviet blocs. That's what real communism is. It's unelected boards ruling over you. I think I made that point, so I'll just move on. And that will be our quote of the day. Watching television is like taking black spray paint to your third eye. Uh, that was from Bill Hicks. And how true it is, it's just like drinking fluoride kills the pineal gland, which is the scientific name for the third eye. Really, we're just being distracted under the television systems and the rest of the mind control to keep us from who we really are, from realizing what's really going on in our world, and, of course, keeping us on our couch and from taking a stand against what's happening. I hope you won't do that. I hope you'll support Prison Planet TV, help us reach more viewers, tell everyone about the InfoWars Nightly News, go out on the streets yourself with the signs, the billboards, the banner hangs, and the rest of it, and let's fight back against this damn system. We're going to be back with Alex Jones and a crucial interview from Jane Graham, witness, eyewitness to the Oklahoma City bombing, saw the feds in action doing what they did. How horrible. And we're also going to show you the Senator Rand Paul interview that was so uh, big and important that we heard earlier today on the show. You'll hear that on the break, as well as contest submissions. Thanks for watching. We'll be back again tomorrow. We are joined by U.S. Senator hailing from Kentucky, Rand Paul. And the freshman senator, as everyone has noticed, has actually been fulfilling his campaign promises to try to cut government and restore our constitutional republic. And he joins us from Washington, D.C. Senator, thank you for coming on with us. Glad to be with you, Alex. There is so much to talk about, uh, but I noticed that you're uh, trying to point out that Interpol is now operating inside our country with diplomatic immunity. Yeah, I'm kind of concerned about having an international police force in our country with the ability, maybe, to extradite U.S. citizens and send them to another country. Egypt, as you know, over the last couple of months has been holding some American pro-democracy workers in their country, and they were going to try them on trumped-up political charges. And so a couple of months ago, I said, you know what, should we send $2 billion to a country that treats us this way and treats our citizens? So I tried to hold up their foreign aid, and as a consequence, I think partly of what I was doing, they released our American citizens. Then they came home, and then Secretary Clinton went ahead and released their aid. I wrote her a letter and said, you know, she shouldn't do it because 
these prosecutions were still ongoing right now in absentia. They're prosecuting them without being there. They also made the U.S. taxpayer pay a $5 million ransom for these Americans to come home, promising they would come back to to stand trial. But then this week we've learned that Egypt has asked Interpol for international warrants. They have these red letter warrants that can be used anywhere in the world. And most people say, oh, that could never happen in America. We would never let that happen. But Interpol is doing this in other countries. Saudi Arabia asked Interpol to return a Saudi journalist from Malaysia who had said something about a a, a Muhammad that they found offensive and they were going to accuse him of blasphemy. Interpol picked him up in Malaysia and took him back to Saudi Arabia. He will now face the death penalty for blasphemy. But the scary thing is he's being picked up by Interpol. And the scary thing is, is what kind of authority does Interpol have in the United States? And President Obama expanded their authority with an executive order in December, giving them diplomatic immunity. So all of this uh, concerns me. Senator, we also saw just last year the South African U.N. summit, and they called for a global U.N. environmental crime tribunal where you will be arrested if you deny man-made global warming. And that made headlines in Europe, but almost no news here. So they're openly calling Uh, for this international power, and four of our Supreme Court justices have said that we should get our rules from the U.N., not the Constitution. So I think you're right to be very concerned about this. Well, you know, one of the interactions in the last couple weeks that was very, very telling was the interaction between Senator Sessions and Secretary Panetta in a committee in which Panetta said that if we go to war, of course we'll consult with the U.N. and get their approval, and Sessions asked him, he said, well, You know, isn't there a role here under the Constitution for Congress? And Panetta basically just kept going on about NATO, the U.N., and then he finally sort of said, well, yeah, we would probably inform Congress of what we're doing. But never in there was there any understanding that they had to get approval or permission from Congress. And, of course, you've spoken on the Senate floor about that, one of the few senators to actually be concerned about the Constitution being brazenly violated. And if anyone... I was confused by what the Secretary of Defense said and tries to come out and say, well, he didn't really mean that. We have the letter, as you know, last year where Obama responded to Congress with the Libya war and said, I don't need your authorization. I have the U.N. And that brings me to my next question, Senator. Uh, Are you or others going to call for the House to begin impeachment investigations? I know Congressman Jones has introduced legislation that if Obama starts another war without congressional war power authorization, that they will then trigger that. Uh, but that's not moving very fast. I mean, this is this is extremely brazen, like Caesar crossing the Rubicon. If you or or your father, uh, who would get a lot more attention than Congressman Jones, were to call for impeachment you know, investigations, at least to begin hearings on impeachment, Uh, then I think that might get the executive to stop saying it follows the orders of the U.N., Senator. Well, I think the first step is to stop him in his tracks. Uh, We we tried very hard on on the Libya motion. In fact, what we did on the Libya, when he went to war with Libya, is we introduced his own words. His words in 2007, when he ran for office, said that no president should unilaterally go to war without congressional authority, which basically just restates the Constitution. And good for him. That's what he ran on. That was part of his platform. And then he went around and did exactly the opposite when he became president. And this is not the first time a Democrat or a Republican has changed their mind once they became president. They sort of believed in limitations on the presidential power until they actually became the president, and then they believe in unlimited powers. But we will fight him tooth and nail. We fought him. We introduced his own words on the Senate floor and asked people to vote for it. But the disappointing thing was 10 people in the U.S. Senate believe in the Constitution and believe that the Congress should have to declare war before a president goes to war. We got only 10 votes, and they were all Republicans. Not one Democrat voted for the the words of their own president when he ran for office. What did you make of the CIA director a month ago? It was in Wired Magazine, um, if you caught it. What did you make of him saying, yeah, we're watching you, we're reading your emails, we're building a giant NSA center, and then Congress said, we want to see uh, the details of that NSA center, and Obama 
said you don't get to see it. Since when does Congress not get to get details of the new NSA center that they admit is to read all our emails and listen to our phone calls illegally, Senator? Well, I'd say the one good news as far as Big Brother snooping on you is that there is some pushback. You know, the, the SOPA battle, the, the battle over, you know, the Internet and whether or not they could shut down different websites indiscriminately based on accusations without a day in court, without, you know, any Fourth Amendment or jury trial uh, protections. You know, we won that battle and won it in a big way. And so there is a pushback. That was really the first battle since I've been up here that we actually won, and we won in a clear fashion because the Internet, the grassroots community, really defeated the establishment. They were planning on passing that under unanimous consent, which means they were just going to push it right through. If I objected, they were going to roll right over me. And the Internet woke up. People, uh, a lot of people who listen and get their news, you know, from you and from Infowars.com, that the Internet rose up and as a power uh, did, did stop them in their tracks. We're not winning all the battles, but there's going to be another battle over cybersecurity bills coming up, and we have to worry about the power that's being given to agencies like the NSA to snoop on uh, personal information on the Internet. So we're, we, haven't, we aren't done yet, but I think it was encouraging when we beat the SOPA bill. Well, it's good to know you're there because we've got on the other side Senator Jay Rockefeller famously saying in committee, we would have been better off never inventing the Internet. I mean, that's a wild statement. The Internet's the great equalizer, you know, because now people get their news and they look around for the news. And I think it's a, particularly young people now who are so cynical of all the politicians they see on TV. And I think this is why my dad has become so popular is because they see him as a genuine voice, someone who they can believe and trust in. And that makes a big difference. And the Internet has been the, the fountain of all that. And I think it will it really is leading to a, a, a movement out there that's neither Republican nor Democrat, but really wants a, a different way. Certainly the establishment has to know they can't put the genie back in the bottle. People have had a taste of real choice in news and information and ideas. Freedom is catching on thanks to you, your father, and tens of millions of supporters across the planet. Yep, well, that's one of my, father, my father's favorite lines as he's out on the trail is that freedom is popular. Freedom brings people together. And it's one of the amazing things you see when you go to his rallies. You see people of all races, all economic levels. You see working class people. You see uh, Chamber of Commerce types. But you see much more diverse crowd at the Ron Paul rallies, and particularly the youth, than you see at any Republican function. And it's what the Republicans, if they had half a clue, would realize nationally is that Ron Paul is a phenomenon getting five to 10,000 people at speeches more than any other candidate. And they need to realize that they need that momentum and they need that to win in the fall. And I'm just hoping that they will do some outreach to him to try to get him to participate in their convention. Speaking of your father, Congressman Ron Paul, who has said that if he doesn't win the presidency, he, he's going to retire. Texas, of course, is very sad about that, but the idea continues on. And undoubtedly, we're winning the war, even if he doesn't win the battle, in educating hearts and minds about the true constitutional system. Uh, but, but what is at the heart of the delegate battle and the broker convention strategy? Do you, can you tell us, uh, if Paul doesn't win the full nomination, what what they're going to call for, and can you put to bed these rumors, the latest one yesterday in the Seattle Times, uh, it's all over the news that um, if Mitt Romney was to get the nomination, that there's discussions of asking you to be vice president. Well, I always tell people if there's a secret plan for that to happen, it's so secret that nobody's let me in on it yet. <laughs> so uh, I kind of doubt that will happen. Um, I do tell people to be considered to be the vice president of the United States is obviously an honor. I mean, it is. And I know some people may not like hearing that, but the, to tell you the truth, it is an honor to be considered and to know that you could have some influence in the direction of which, you know, that the country goes. But I don't probably see that happening, and no one's asking me in particular or specifically about it. Um, with regard to, you know, where my father goes, what the delegate
delegate strategy is, whether it could be a brokered convention. I think it's unlikely. I think now that Santorum has dropped out, unless something changes dramatically in the next couple of primaries, uh, in all likelihood, Romney will collect the numbers necessary to get the nomination uh, sometime in May or June. The, one of the things is, is that if you win five states, you get to get your name placed in nomination and you get guaranteed a position at the, at the convention. And there's still some chance of that. Even though my dad didn't win five states, a lot of the delegations are not decided until you go through the state convention. They have county conventions and they work their way up. And Ron Paul's done very well in Nevada, Missouri, Maine, Iowa, and a couple of the other caucus states. So there's an outside chance that he still wins five states. But uh, I think they'll. I think that's one of the reasons that he'll go on probably giving speeches and traveling around and encouraging voters, uh, at least through the state conventions, which are mostly over in June. Sure, it's a victory just to be there injecting, injecting real issues, moving quickly through some questions in the five minutes we have left, Senator. TSA, um, they have now announced, uh, Congresswoman... Uh, Jackson has announced here in Texas, uh, Sheila Jackson Lee, that they have undercover homeland security outside of the 10th Amendment, TSA now on the buses and the highways. We've known this is coming, but that's just as illegal as Obama taking orders from the U.N. There's got to be some end uh, to this cr craziness. Dave Mustaine was just here in town visiting me a few weeks ago, a uh, you know, rock star from Megadeth, and he complained to me that his 14-year-old uh, daughter got groped at the airport here in Austin. There's got to be some you know, end to this. Can you call for hearings in the Senate? I mean, I isn't it illegal from your constitutional research to have the TSA now on the streets of Texas? Uh, I can't call for hearings. The majority party completely controls hearings. ISA can get hearings in the House and has had some. The interesting thing is, is what happened to you guys in Texas? I thought you guys were going to stand up to the federal government and, and, and uh, ban the TSA from doing that in Texas. The feds threatened a uh, air blockade, military blockade, and uh, the unanimous House then fell to their knees and said, here's our daughters and sons, start groping. Well, we're going to continue the fight up here and uh, really becomes more complicated because this, this ends up becoming not just about personal liberty, it becomes about union power and the fact that the Democrats are big on creating new government unions because they're new voting blocks and new blocks of money that they can get, uh, you know, forced union dues to support their campaigns. So really the TSA is one of the biggest government unions now. And so we've been fighting, you know, to privatize security, many of us, and would like to do that. We will probably propose legislation coming up that will do that, as well as some that will be less dramatic but would actually forbid them from doing uh, pat-downs. Uh, we think the idea of random pat-downs is ridiculous, insulting, and really making no one safe. And, uh, you know, I think uh, that if you made searches based on uh, evidence of suspicious behavior or something like that or um, basically had some kind of um, risk assessment done, then you wouldn't be doing this to elderly women, babies, children, the rest. The other thing that would make it a little better, not perfect, but it would be just to have a frequent flyer program of some sort. And I don't want the government running it, but if it were done privately and voluntarily, I think you could develop some kind of frequent flyer program. Two final questions, uh, Senator Paul. Uh, number one, Everyone has been impressed, uh, even uh, mainstream media has been impressed, that, that, that you could run for office for the first time in your life and be catapulted into the U.S. Senate, and that you have kept your promises and done so well and had such a senatorial, gentlemanly bearing and have learned the procedures and things. I mean, everyone I know across the political spectrum is saying Rand Paul, uh, you know, if Ron Paul doesn't make it, well, Rand Paul is definitely presidential uh, material uh, for the republic. Uh, I mean, I know you don't like to toot your own horn, but uh, I mean, are you starting to think more about running for president? Well, I think it's too early to tell, and a lot of it, you know, depends on what happens with this election. So, you know, we'll wait and see, but I think also the voice within the Senate can be a pretty loud voice, and I'm definitely going to do everything I can to use the position of the Senate to fight for constitutional limited government, to really fight to fend off what I think is a, a coming calamity. If we, if we do not address this debt bomb that's coming at us, 
we really are in for a bad way, and it may be something that hits us before there is even another presidential election. So we're fighting day in, day out to get people around here to wake up to the imminence of this problem. I've been telling people for a year there's a day of reckoning coming, and it's not something we're looking forward to. It's either something where we destroy our currency, and when you destroy a currency, you it leads to chaos in the streets, and we don't want that to happen. All of these problems are fixable, though, and we have a wonderful country with a wonderful heritage, and there is an amazing potential locked up in our country that if it were unleashed and you allow people to freely interact and trade with each other, that we would once again be a, a dominant force in the world if we would just uh, you know, really believe in ourselves and believe in our heritage. I agree with you. Uh, speaking of uh, our heritage, not having high taxes, Buffett, Warren Buffett, the biggest recipient of the banker bailouts domestically, that's, that's McClatchy Associated Press, it's a fact. He says raise taxes on millionaires or people making $150,000 individually or quarter million in a couple. Well, he's the guy that wants that money out of the next bailout on record. I mean, this is asinine. Uh, give us a brief comment on that, Senator, because I know you've got to go. And then what you're going to do on a balanced budget amendment. Well, I tell people I'm getting sick and tired of hearing about Buffett's secretary. I think she makes more money than I do, and I think her <laughs> assets are probably greater than mine. And so I'm not, you know, too concerned about Warren Buffett's secretary. But I think the argument that if two people pay the same percentage in taxes, you know, if he pays 15 percent, his secretary pays 15 percent, let's say she makes $200,000 a year and he makes $20 million a year or $200 million, he pays a thousandfold more in taxes than she does. So the thing is, is you can have progressive taxation with a flat tax code. So the idea that the rich are not paying their fair share in our country is a lie. It is absolutely untrue. We have the most progressive tax code maybe in the world. Our tax code is more progressive than Sweden's tax code. So they, they need to just tell the truth on it. But the bottom line is, is I want the private sector, the pie that is the private sector to be bigger and the pie that is the government sector to be smaller. So I don't want anybody's taxes to go up. And if you're richer than me and you've got three cars and I've got a moped, I need to go out and work harder and I don't need to take it from you. I need to encourage you to hire more people by allowing you to do better. And so I don't really look at people who are wealthy business owners and say, oh, let me drag them down. I look at them and I say, how can we get the government out of the way so this creative person, man or woman, can create more jobs? So I look at it the opposite way, and I think there's enough people left in America who like the idea of the American dream, who like the idea of success. And every generation, there's somebody. I meet people every day whose parents uh, just finished high school and weren't very successful who are now successful in this generation. It doesn't always happen, but that has been the beauty of America is that mobility. And the interesting thing is 60% of the people born in the lowest rung, the bottom 20%, move up out of poverty. 60% of millionaires the following year don't make a million dollars a year. So people move up and down this social ladder all of the time. And uh, that freedom to go up and down the ladder is what really what America is about. Well, the crony monopolist, they know that when you raise taxes over time, it destroys the pie and impoverishes. They want the control, undoubtedly. Uh, it is so refreshing to talk to a senator uh, who does not compromise and is just so real. Senator Rand Paul, thank you so much for the time today. Thank you, Alex. Amazing. Welcome back to this Wednesday edition of InfoWars Nightly News. This is a very important interview we're about to do. In fact, in the nine months of the Nightly News, this is probably the most important interview we've done to date. Why? Because the woman we're about to talk to is a survivor of a very serious false flag criminal attack. And of course, that is the bombing of the Alfred P. Murrow building on April 19th. 1995. And of course, the anniversary is tomorrow. That's why we're doing the show here tonight, but I intend to air this interview tomorrow on the radio to the 3 million daily listeners. 
because it is so important. Jane Graham's testimony, she was the head of the HUD department in the Alfred P. Murrow building that day, and she lost a lot of friends, and, and of course she was injured. And her testimony ties together with the testimony of police officers and others and is completely damning. She is a star witness in all of this. There were other eyewitnesses, people like Terrence Yakey, who was police officer of the year and saved people inside that saw some of the things she saw. He was told, if you don't shut up, we're going to kill you. And they did kill him. He was tortured to death. Then there's police officers like Don Browning, who on my show right here have said that the FBI came in and told him, you and your wife are going to be killed if you don't shut up. He was the head of the K-9 unit. He was the sergeant in charge. He was there minutes after. These are eyewitnesses. So people have died and been threatened to bring you this information. So this lady has a lot of courage. It was about a year ago that I interviewed her last, and she said, I think this is going to be one of my last interviews, and I've twisted her arm to come back here, but she's told me this is probably the last interview she'll ever do. And she's uh, joined, of course, via video Skype, with the director of the film, uh, James Lane. Uh, and, of course, the film is Noble Lie. Great to have you guys here with us this evening. A very important interview, as I just said. Uh, James, introduce those who may not know who uh, the little lady is sitting next to you. Jane Graham here is one of the survivors of the Oklahoma City bombing on April 19th, 1995. Uh, she was actually at a uh, training session that morning when the explosive went off, and uh, she was gracious enough to be interviewed in the documentary, and we're really grateful to have her here today. Thank you. Thank you. Where do you guys want to start? I mean, this is an important final interview. Uh, how about uh, why were you in the film? Why do you think the film of Noble Eye is important? And then briefly recapping the basics of what you witnessed. Well, I, I think I should start two weeks prior to the bombing because I had gone down to um, the um, snap bar in the in the building and I had gone in for coffee and sitting um, there and then um, in one of the booths and then across from me in another booth were two ladies that were sitting there drinking coffee and one of the ladies was telling her friend that um, she would talk to someone in the um, I uh, with the uh, FBI office at 50 Penn Place that they had gotten a uh, that their friend told her that they had received a um, fax saying that there was uh, going to be a bombing of a federal building in Oklahoma City. And uh, she took that and gave that to um, to her boss. And he said yes, that they were aware and not to worry about it. And um, I'm listening to this conversation and I'm saying, um, God, you know, surely they wouldn't bomb 50 Penn Place. That's the public, you know, it's not a government building. It's, but I was concerned uh, at the time about it. So I went home and I told my husband about it. And I, I said, um, you know, I can't believe that, you know, that they're not terribly concerned over this. And they said for her not to worry about it, they'd take care of it. They, they were aware of it. I didn't think any more about that. And then uh, the Friday before the bombing, um, I, when I drove to work, I had a reserved parking space, which was on the first level down where you could get out and go directly into the elevators and then go up to the floors, to the ground floor or onto your offices. And when I arrived there, I saw three men who were standing there um, they were behind a station wagon. It, it reminded me of the uh, Ford um, uh, station wagon, that, the, the large one that used to have the, like the wood on it. And um, I thought they're parked in a reserved parking space. And and as I recall, the the car was uh, the station wagon was uh, kind of a light green color, and it was really dirty all over. That you couldn't see the plates good, everything, because there was just real dirt all over it. And again, that struck me as odd, but the men were standing there, and one of the gentlemen had a large, um, looked like plans of the building, 
and he was pointing in the direction of the northeast and the southeast of the building. And uh, uh, there was another gentleman standing there with him. Both of those men were dressed in jeans, short sleeve shirts. They were about, I would say, probably 5'9", five, 5'10". Five, they were um, very muscular, um, obviously very good athlete. They may have been, someone said to me, what did you think they were? And I said, if I were going to give, uh, I would say military, uh, a surveyor, uh, those were the things that if I were having to describe them, um, I really thought for a minute that maybe they were there because of uh, we had had some gas odors previously and then telephone problems, which, you know, they've had people come in and, and deal with. And so but I was watching them and then there was a man there, the other gentleman beside him who was taking directions from the from the man who seemed to be in charge and he was the one with the uh, plans. And um, he had a paper sack, and he had some wiring, which looks like a telephone wiring. And that was another reason that I thought perhaps that they were with the telephone company. And I went, um, I just kind of watched them as I was standing there and moving slowly forward. And there was another gentleman there, and he was... He had on black pants, black cowboy boots, black hat, I can remember. And he had a, uh, the band on his cowboy hat had um, uh, silver um, metallic uh, uh, round uh, part places on it. And um, as he was watching me, he was very good looking. His hair came down to his collar and very dark hair, very straight eyebrows, uh, uh, as I said, very nice looking. And the, the gentleman who had the, uh, I was watching, he had a bar of, of what I would call, um, I wasn't sure what it was. It looked like putty. And uh, the gentleman who looked to be in charge told him, put that back. And he put that and he put the wiring back into the paper sack. Then he closed that. And then he went over to the door behind the driver's uh, seat and put that inside there and then came back to stand. And at that point, the gentleman who I had seen there that was standing there, who I later identified as Andrew Strassmauer, he walked over to the north side of the wall and uh, had a cigarette over there. And uh, then he came back. And But they all three of them at that time were watching me. And I thought, well, I'll, I'll say something later to GSA and then uh, because I had a meeting that morning and I had a class to go to. So I went on in the building and I really got busy. I didn't think any more about it at the time. And um, I went on up to my uh, office and um, uh, just just didn't think about, you know, yeah. about that issue on that Friday. Let me interject a, a, a question here, Jane. Just to condense and recap this bombshell information that's a lot of it been corroborated by others over time and, and, and all these connections. A couple of weeks before, you hear women saying, yeah, the FBI says there's going to be a federal building get bombed. And that's later come out in court documents that they had, quote, had the threats. As the system, those that actually carried out the false flag were, you know, beginning to create that false history. Then... Uh, before the bombing, you see these individuals, and I guess woman's intuition, you can see guys with a purpose. I mean, these are bombers. Uh, I mean, what was it about them that made you stop and pay attention? Was it just woman's intuition? I mean, I'm just trying to guess why were you, why were you paying attention to these people? It's kind of a side issue, but okay. since I brought it up, what was your exact position there uh, at HUD? I was a multi, at that point, I was a multifamily uh, specialist and uh, dealing with um, apartment complexes, anything having to do with multifamily housing. And I was also at that time head of the homeless program. And I was the regional vice president of AFGE. Sure, because that information is important background. And again, uh, what floor were you on? Actually, I was on the seventh floor. That's where my union office was, and that's also where my my uh, office space was for my job. Okay, so so give us the dates. It was a few weeks before that you heard the woman talking about the FBI says a federal building is going to be bombed in Oklahoma City. 
what was the date again that you saw? That that was no, that was two weeks before the bomb. That says two weeks before the bombing. Yes, yes. So a few weeks before you heard the woman say that. Yes. Uh, but, but but what was the date of? The, the Friday before the bombing, on the night, the Friday before the nineteenth. Uh, that's when I drove in and I saw these men. The reason I, they came, I was curious about them was that the parking spot in which they were in is a reserved parking spot. And I knew the cars that normally parked there, and that was not one of them. And since they were behind that car, I wondered why they were there. And then I was curious, just curious, because they were talking, they had that sack, they had the plans, they were looking. I, I even contemplated at one point, maybe thinking about just going over and said, can I help you? And I thought, no, I'm late, I'm running behind and I need to get upstairs. And so, and then, you know, you get the a feeling when they don't want to talk to you, you don't want to figure you better go on and just mind your own business. And one of the major significant points of this is the, that she later identified one of those people in the basement as Andrea Strassmeyer. Andrea Strassmeyer uh, is actually, uh, he's a suspected government informant because he was uh, working with the Texas Light Infantry uh, and uh, militia, and they saw him going into a federal building in Texas. Uh, using a key code. He later comes to Oklahoma City and starts working out of Elohim City. Uh, we know that there were many Southern Poverty Law Center uh, agents working there, uh, many informants. Uh, the, the founder of the city itself uh, was actually an informant. Now, uh, uh, Carol Howe, ATF informant, actually said that uh, Andrea Strassmeyer was one of the people that were going into Oklahoma City prior to the bombing, scouting locations, uh, almost to the extent where she told her friends not to not to go to any federal buildings in April. You know, and so there, to just briefly expand on that, because there's so much evidence. It's not a lack of evidence. It's too much evidence. It later came out in memos via lawsuits, uh, thanks to Jesse Trinidu and other lawyers, that the Southern Poverty Law Center had informants at the very top of Elohim City, this white supremacist command center. You've got Strassmeyer, who's the son of a prominent German, who's over here. And we know how our government likes to use Germans for dirty work. And it just goes on and on and on from there. Yeah, we actually interviewed someone from Elohim City for the documentary, uh, Josiah Stone. He identifies McVeigh being there at the compound uh, at the same time that Strassmeyer was basically head of security. And then we have people like Hal Turner, who I said for 10 years was a Fed, admitted now Fed, white supremacist leader. We have the uh, white supremacist uh, caught being led by the FBI in Orlando. That's Orlando Sentinel. I mean, it's not that the FBI is infiltrating these white supremacists, they're running them. Yes. Yes, and Andre Strassmeyer, after the bombing, was whisked out of the country through Mexico uh, via his attorney, Kirk Lyons, and uh, the FBI called him on the telephone and asked him if he was involved. That was the extent of their interview with him. The vehicle that you're describing in the basement actually matches uh, a description of uh, the vehicle that Andrea Strassmeyer was driving, uh, where he'd actually been pulled over, and then they get a call to say, let him go. Yes, yes, that's correct. And they were told not to search his luggage, to let him go through, uh, do not uh, detain him for any purposes. And, uh, and it was interesting, too, that... Uh, Andrew Strassmeyer's father was a good friend of the president's. And so they had a lot of strings that they could pull and attach to get him out of this country. And, um, but there were more people involved. And I tried, BZ Lawton and I tried desperately to get a stay of execution because we wanted McVeigh as a witness. And they would not the, the court overruled that and said they would not allow that, and they went ahead with that execution. I really believe I had seen him several times in the elevator. He was always dressed in his um, uh, camouflage pants and top. Uh, he'd get off on the floor where the military was based uh, and go in and see the recruiters and all. Uh, he never spoke to anyone. He always was very solemn as you know he looked around and in fact I kind of laughed because everybody always says hello to everybody and uh, I said well I said if he's new here in this building I said he's not going to fit in too well with with the rest of the people 
incredible. You know, we can get caught in all the different, it's not even minutia, but all the parts of this. Jane Graham, you're, you know, you're here speaking out for the upteenth time today. Why, why should people be concerned? And then before we went on air, you were saying that, you know, basically, you're, this is one of your last interviews. It's time for the population to get involved. In your own words, what do you want to say to the millions of people that are watching this and listening to it? The main thing I'd like to tell everybody is pay attention. Do not believe that the government is your friend. What they are doing and what I feel and I honestly believe, if you research it, you will find that I am right. And that is every time they try to get a law passed through Congress, which takes away some of your rights, they institute some action some creation, some diversion that is significant enough to get the legislation through. At that time, you looked at um, the Patriot Act. They were really con trying to get through gun control. Um, they are altering the way that you are being allowed to pick and choose what you feel is the best thing for your own life. Your individual rights are being taken away, and it's frightening. In fact, um, more and more you're, in the last four years, you are finding that um, you are not able to, uh, the government is taking more charge of what you're allowed to do. Your children, what, what you can say, you cannot say. What they are telling you you're allowed to do, you're not allowed to do. Uh, and they're infringing, they are no longer recognizing, especially, I think, under um, President Obama, they're no longer recognizing the Constitution. And, and the courts, I don't believe there's such a thing anymore as the justice system. Uh, they are all bought and paid for. They all know um, they want their, uh, their way done. They tell you, they threaten you. They can do whatever they please. Um, with no impunity, um, they are allowed uh, to uh, just take orders only from the very top. And, it, and it's an example, if you just look every day in the paper, you see more and more. Your speech is being affection, affected, what you can talk about, what you can say, um, what you can own, have. And this is why we say, you know, 17 years tomorrow, why is the truth still important? People are like, you know, why don't you let this go? Because the people that were involved in the cover-up of this are still in positions of power today. I mean, look at uh, Eric Holder with the Fast and Furious. You have over 2,000 people that have died in that event alone. And it's come out in the mainstream press that the ATF is saying that they're going to utilize this event to enact further gun control legislation. Why is it hard to believe that they would do something that with 168 people? You know, I mean, they're just become more blatant about it and exposing this type of crime, holding these people accountable, I believe actually saves lives. Well, that's well, another. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to state um, I have always maintained that um, not only did the government know about this bombing ahead of time, the actual well, there are other things leading up to that, too. But the actual morning of the bombing, um, when I came into work and was dropped off at the front door, there was a man in a suit there that had um, two individuals who had ATF raid jackets on. And I thought how strange that they would be standing out in front of the building talking like there's nothing going on. And they're supposed to be, and all the times, the years I was there, I have never seen one ever with a raid jacket on and didn't even recognize that what it was until I found out later from uh, someone that that, is indi that indicates that there is something going down in that building and they have to dress so that they can be identifiable uh, readily. And in the parking lot across the street that day, there were cars there from Arizona, Colorado, New Mexico. It, it was amazing that, um, that they had um, uh, all of these 
other cars there that generally were not there from out of state. Yeah, and their stories changed back and forth. Oh, they were at a golf tournament, they were at yes. this, but yet the ATF is outside the building that morning, identified by Jane Graham and other witnesses, uh, and not a single ATF agent w uh, died in the building. They weren't yeah. in the building. They weren't, they, and, and they, there was witnesses that overheard them saying, is this why we got Paige to not come in this morning? Yeah, that's right, uh, we should point out they had, uh, what, an entire floor, didn't they? Most, uh, yes, most. And that was actually uh, where the some of the, the greater damage was. Uh, there was a, a ordinance inside there. There was explosives. There were weapons. They claimed that they didn't exist. And we show in the in a noble lie, we actually have footage of them taking out C4 and uh, weapons. Out and of you, the have the that governor, they didn't exist. you have the governor before he got the talking point admitting they'd remove the bombs and the bomb squad. And just to be clear for people that are new to this information, the ATF you know, basically had to threaten people, hey, bandage us up. And they're like, well, well, you're not, you weren't, you're not hurt. And those people, you know, end up dead, basically. So this is why Terrence Yakey, who was cop of the year for saving people, he saw all this and started speaking out. They killed him. And then we have you know, other police officers who were there as well, like Mr. Browning. And the FBI comes to him repeatedly and says, we're going to kill you and your wife. Shut up. <laughs> I mean, this is, and, he, and he's in your film, A Noble Lie That I Should Add is available at InfoWars.com. But the point here is, this is life and death. I've been death threatened just as a talk show host covering this. I get death threatened so much I pretty much ignore it, but these are death threats where they tell you what's gone on in your house, they tell you who you've been talking to. I want to ask Jane if she's had any threats. I know Hoppy Heidelberg has, where they come to his house and basically point guns at him. I mean, that's how you know this stuff is so incredibly real. But again, the ATF, we know, blew up a rider truck months before in a test. That's even been on the news. We know the feds have confiscated all the surveillance tapes. I mean, it's so nightmarish that the feds could come and pick a building with a daycare, because most don't have daycares, and pick it. And we know that's probably why McVeigh, well, according to Nichols and others, got so mad. He's like, it's one thing to blow up some feds to get a police state and to shut down states' rights, but you're going to blow kids up. It's like kind of Tony Montana and Scarface. He'll kill people, but not little kids. You know, I, I mean, it, it, it just shows. Th and then you have one of the top FBI guys lying and saying he was in Dallas. Turns out he was there the night before we had the receipts. Uh, and then you've got the deputy attorney general's own memos where he's, we've got to cover this up, get down to Oklahoma. And now he's the attorney general and he ships guns to Mexico. And the memo comes out to blame the Second Amendment. And they admit it's killed 2,000 in Mexico. Uh, hundreds in the U.S., three police officers, three Border Patrol. I mean, this is a false flag right there with Operation yes. Fast and Furious. I know I'm ranting, but my God, this is so obvious. Jane, what do you say to that? I agree with you. I, you know, I do agree. It's, it's, uh, it's frightening um, that the government is allowed to use the power uh, to do and enact anything that they want in order to achieve power and i really you know it's all about power and rights and it, if you are concerned uh, if a person is not concerned about their individual rights then god help this country uh, it's it's um uh it's it's just unbelievable there is so much there is so much now that the government is doing to take care of everybody for free in order to get their votes and and you know if you're getting free money out there if you're getting everything free and you're not working for anything uh and i'm not talking about people who can't find a job i'm not talking about that we have real problems in this country we have problems a lot of it having and a real concern is is the police the fbi cia the people who are in control and and what they are doing this is not something that has just come about overnight this has been well planned well thought out um, after the bombing uh, people can go back and look the first thing Clinton said was this was a terrorist attack uh, um, well orchestrated uh, Janet Reno was on there talking about it and, and then they pushed the uh, omnibus then, terrorist bill right and yeah. then and then right after that it wasn't it wasn't but the same day, and they're saying, no, no, there was just a couple of individuals. It went from one to the militia first, then the individuals. They were blaming everybody. Talk around. radio. Yeah. And, but the problem is, what about the government and what about their liability? You know, 
we we tried a lawsuit. Uh, we filed that against the government, uh, and um, we have tried various things. And my concern also is that when you do things like that, um, it does put you out there, I think, in the public, and they all say, oh, well, you know, I had people I worked with for years, and they said, oh, God, you know, uh, the government would never, ever do anything like that where there's children. I said, get real. I said, this is about power. This is about taking away your rights. And I said, you know, I, I'm, I was very fortunate. I grew up in, in a house where my father was uh, a union man. He was an executive uh, in Chicago. And he said, listen, nobody gives you anything for nothing. He said, not only that, he said, Watch what you say. Look what the government does. He said, you know, you better be careful. Look at it from every angle. Don't just believe something because somebody tells you that. And so, you know, I grew up wary of just hearing and believing what somebody is telling me. But people would say to me, I worked. Well, that's a lie. They would never. I said, yeah, yeah, they would. Power is a very big uh, ego trip for anybody. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Janet Reno was out there and saying, you try to get information. What happened? They, they went out and they, um, they stamped everything, you know, that it was, uh, national security. Once it gets that stamp on it, you can't go in and look at it. And let's expand on that. Uh, I mean, you guys are the real experts on this. I've gone over it. It's in the film, but James, how many video cameras, because I have a copy of the L.A. Times and Washington Times, where valiant FBI agents, this is a decade ago now, went public and said, yeah, we've seen the tapes. It's John O. number two and other men. The, you know, the tapes weren't erased. The tapes weren't, you know, not on that day. That's a lie. We've seen them. So these were good guys in the FBI, and there are other bombers, and then yeah. they basically get in trouble. But the point is... There were so many cameras on there, and they declared national security on them. All these lawsuits to get them, they won't release them. Right there. Why don't you release who did the bombing if it's McVeigh by himself? Exactly. If it's uh, 17 years on and all the uh, perpetrators have been brought to justice, why can't we not see the tapes? And this is one of the early documents that Jesse Trinidad got that uh, had the FBI actually describing what they saw in the tapes. And it says that they saw the suspects get out of the vehicle suspects plural there were additional people inside the or additional person inside the van with mcveigh you know there were hundreds of cameras hundreds of tapes that were duplicated uh we interviewed the gentleman that actually duplicated the tapes said hundreds of them and the fbi is saying that they can't find them you know one of the one of the biggest events that they ever investigated and they say that they can't find them luckily jesse trinity is working with a judge that is actually t trying to take them to task yeah, up in salt lake doing a pretty yeah. good job in fact just ruled yeah. against the feds again i want to ask you about that but i want to get stuff on record here you know with jane while we've got her absolutely to uh, to uh, break down what's going on but looking at this and seeing everything that they've done i mean it is just so mind-boggling but a lot of people say well i see history channel discovery channel they're airing all these shows of the official story right now not mm -hmm. showing the local newscast with the bombs not showing the governor saying bombs none of this but then i talked to all the survivors and people they've done all these interviews with the media and told them what you're saying now and the media across the board cuts it Exactly. And this is what's very significant about Jane's story is that the building was actually coming down eight to 10 seconds before the truck bomb goes off. Now, there's other people that were in the building that day that say the exact same thing. VZ Lawton got hit by debris and another gentleman jumped under his desk and then the glass blows in. According to the FEMA report, that blast wave was traveling 1700 feet per second. How is that possible? I mean, you were in Windows 95 class that morning. Yes, right? I had just gone up to that and uh, from the seventh floor to the ninth and where I was, just prior to that, everybody was killed. Um, but when I got up there, uh, yes, you could be, what you felt initially was the the ground, below, which is all concrete. You felt it, first you felt the ground rumbling back and forth and um, going from east to west, and then, or west to east, uh, going back and forth. And then you felt, a few seconds later, you felt the uh, rise of the floor underneath you actually that rise of force going straight up and that loud noise and then when i looked up 
the only thing I saw was the roof suspended in air above me. And um, the smoke, The instructor actually said that it was an earthquake, yes, right? Yes, she thought it was an earthquake and was telling everybody to get under their table at that time or, you know, under their desk. And I sat there for a second because I said, no, this isn't an earthquake. Whatever this force is, it was so strong. And uh, then I was thrown, I got started to move and I was thrown over to the center of the room. And um, uh, the next thing I knew, my two of my coworkers, um, uh, Sonia Key and Joy McGirt, came over and they were digging stuff off of me and getting me up on my feet. And I said, first I told them, I said, I can't move. And um, I'm afraid to move. And she, they said, no, you have to get up and get out of here. And um, it's, it was, you know, it's a bomb. And um, I looked out and everything around me was so black. The smoke was so thick that it smelled like sulfur. And I had to put my hands over my nose and face because if you were to breathe in, it felt like it would burn your, it would just burn your lungs. So they helped me go down the staircase and go down. But when we went down, when we reached the, the floor where the children were, there was a man in the doorway and there was debris and things along the stairwell going down. I asked him, I said, I need to get in there and help bring the children out. And I was really concerned about that. And he said, no, the children are taken care of. Don't you have to get out, go out the building and go on down. So that's what we did. But I do want to stress that um, getting back to uh, the bombing um, itself, I saw two men. I saw one man the day before the bombing. This was on a Monday afternoon, and he was carrying a handheld, uh, and I presume it was a satellite phone. Uh, but he was talking. He was talking to it, and and he says, "Well, now how does this work?" And uh, I remember being able to hear that. And he was a tall gentleman. He was like six foot one, maybe something like that, six or two. And no, I think maybe six one. And uh, but gray hair, had glasses on, and had a GSA uniform on. And I looked at him, and I thought, God, you know, he really looks kind of old to be learning a new job. You know, I mean, he had never, I'd never seen him before in all these years. And I thought, well, maybe somebody is on vacation or training or something. And they've just put this guy in there for the day. Well, I let it go. And then the next morning, that was uh, the, the day before the bombing. Then the next day of the bombing, uh, when I came in after seeing those men outside, here, out of, I was going to mail a letter inside because we had a post box there. And right to the south of that post box uh, for the mail, there was a doorway that led to the stairwell. And out of the stairwell came this man and another gentleman. And they looked at me, they tucked their heads down, and uh, they were, I don't think they were more than, at the very most, maybe two two and a half, three feet from me. And what, and the younger, the, the shorter gentleman, he had on a t-shirt underneath his, they both had on those uniforms and and I thought from GSA, and I thought, well, now that's strange, we have two, you know, and they were moving. They were, once they looked at me, they put their heads down and they scooted around the corner. And I thought, well, maybe they're just somebody here, you know, uh, and I mentioned that they, I thought they may be from outside even. And who did you later identify that, that man as? Yes, I, uh, uh, I looked and looked and I found, uh, I was shown some pictures by another investigator and I identified him as Gary Hunt. And um, it was, oh, some time after that after that it occurred some months after i did have i had gone to i had gone to ohio to visit my son for the holidays and um, my daughter was there at the house and she was over for the day to take care of my home and everything and the doorbell rang and um, uh, she opened the door and in walks a gentleman uh, from um, arizona and uh, he was with another man, and he walked in the house, and he walked over to the telephones and starts disconnecting everything. And he said, um, 
because my daughter said, my mother isn't here. And he said, well, I, I want you to tell your mother that uh, I'm a friend of Gary Hunt's and she has identified the wrong person. <laughs> And uh, she needs to be aware of that, and I want her to know that. And I thought, well, that's strange. You know, he comes all the way out there to tell me that. And, and um, so when she called me long distance and told me, and I said, okay, thanks, you know, thanks for telling me and everything. And she told him if they didn't leave, she would call the police. And so they did leave. Who is and Gary Hunt? <laughs> he is a special agent uh, for the FBI. Yeah. And then, of course, we've got Danny Boy, one of the head FBI guys. You said he was in Dallas and got a flight up there the day of the bombing, and it turned out there were no flights, and he wasn't on the flights. And then we learned hotel receipts. Danny Boy was uh, actually there the day before. Tell us about Danny. Uh, Danny Colson, yes, uh, he actually uh, said that he had driven up here in a, in a big hurry uh, that day because he was, we actually have video of him, uh, you know, on the scene that day. Uh, and it later came out that, uh, you know, he, it, that it, it wasn't, there was no way that he could have done that. The, the, his claims of the hotel receipts, everything, he had to have been here prior to, uh, to the event. Well, also to um, Alex, I, I want to bring in that uh, Louis Free, his assistant was there that morning at the right after the bombing they have pictures of her directing people the, you know the fire department couldn't even go in to rescue anybody because she would not allow anybody in there uh other than fbi people and uh, they were taking out they were taking out money they were taking out um oh, i understand all the, the papers uh, papers yeah. from uh the, um, and that later got confirmed that, that you got the head Clinton yes. people, you've got the FBI director's assistant there to block the fire department from, I mean, on the scene. I mean, this is incredibly yes. scripted, yeah. incredibly staged. What type of intimidation did you actually experience? Uh, I felt like my phone was being tapped because when I would pick it up, you get these clicking noises on it. And... Uh, I, call, I did finally call the phone depart, uh, phone company about it, and I said, you know, I really believe my phone is tapped. And I said, can you check that? And they said, well, you know, uh, I said, I want to find out if it is. They said, well, we really can't report that to you. Uh, if it is tapped, uh, we will notify the police department. And I said, well, what if it's the government that's doing it? And they said, well, we're sorry, we can't give you that information. Well, after that, it stopped, and then I didn't have it anymore. So, Alex, it was another it was another uh, lesson. If you're not paying attention, uh, it's amazing what uh, what they can do. I know when I went over to some of the people's different people's homes, that uh, I was told that. You know that they could sit in the that the FBI, the federal people were sitting in cars, which were two blocks away, and they could hear everything that was being said mm -hmm. within the house. Well, and the phone tapping. I mean, this was yeah. also something that the Oklahoma Bombing Investigation Committee experienced. Uh, they actually mm -hmm. called a a number that they had that could identify if the phone was being tapped, and they and it was. Uh, you know, so they were definitely monitoring anybody that was mm -hmm. countering the official story and actually trying to get mm -hmm. the truth out. I mean, you know, who are people going to believe? Uh, you know, the actual survivors that were in the building, like Jane and VZ, uh, you know, or the official story. And so they did keep a close eye on them and it's you know it, it's it's uh, again it shows human nature and that with all the people you know i was so distraught over the fact that in this country that they would come in they would bomb where there were children involved uh and uh it's being taken care of uh, and it's and, and who is there but the same FBI leaders, whether it was with us or Ruby Ridge or anywhere, you know, the same people keep coming up, heading up the investigations. They're the ones who give the orders. Uh, it's amazing that after all of this took place, all of the people, whether it was the police chief, whomever, they all got wonderful jobs making big money, uh, improvements, and it's just, I don't know, it's so 
discouraging uh, that people will not stand up. Even my own people within my within HUD that were there. There were so many good workers. There's so many good people. They were wonderful. And yet, you know, they are so one-sided in that most of them refuse to believe that this can't be anything other than what the government says it is, even when they change their story a number of times. And um, I tried to get them to identify. I wanted us to look at pictures. I asked to look at pictures of, of people, of, of FBI people, people I thought I could identify through the police department. I went to several attorneys about it. Uh, I talked about it to the FBI. I sent a letter to um, Stephen Jones. I sent a copy to my own attorney, my doctor, and for just for um, verification of what I was saying to the FBI, I gave them descriptions of the men that I saw, precisely where they were, times, everything. I had an appointment with one FBI agent. His name was Agent Schwecky, and um, I had to. Be, it was going to meet me in my union office, and I arrived that day. He never showed up, and then I finally called the number he left me, and he said, oh, I've got busy with something else. I can't make it. So we set another date, and again, he didn't come, and so that was it. And then uh, the FBI did come to uh, Department of Housing and Urban Development, and they went to the um, Indi they, they met us all in the Indian uh, Division, and they interviewed everybody there. And they wanted to know, when I was being interviewed by a female agent, she said, I would like to know uh, what you saw that day. They had a standard script that they were asking questions. And I said, uh, I sent you all a letter. Do you not have that on file, my letter telling you everything I saw, the men I saw, what took place she said, there's nothing in the file about a letter or what you have said. So I said, you turn this over and you write down what I'm going to tell you. And I gave her the same story. And um, I said, in other words, in a 10 block radius that they were doing this uh, interviewing of people, I said, you ask them where they were, what they were doing, you know, very, very bland mm -hmm statements you know there was nothing in there asking them did you see anything what you i tell you when i saw when i was told by an fbi agent that the men that i saw were um were employees of the um journal record building i said okay i said if i'm if i if misjudge somebody i will apologize i will say i'm wrong you know that that's all right and to do that. So I proceeded to take it upon myself. And there was another woman investigator at the time here in Oklahoma City. And I said, would you go with me? I want to find these men that were the, that were the uh, me uh, mechanical people, uh, maintenance men over there. So the building was closed and we started looking and I got the, the men's names. And I looked one of them in the phone book and I went out to his house. He lived in Bethany. And I rang the doorbell, and his wife came to the phone, and I said, can you tell me, is your husband? She said, well, gave me the address where he worked down off of Reno. And so I went down there, and uh, it was a um, cleaning place and janitorial and all that. And I went up, well, I saw his name underneath the sign on of the picture of him on the second floor, and I said, this isn't the man. And here you are, you know, a, a survivor of the, the bombing, and you're doing more of an investigation yeah. than the FBI. And it seems like this is a, that what we see throughout the entire uh, investigation was that it was all about quantity of, uh, of documents, you know, mm -hmm. just, to, just to create this, this body of, of uh, supposed investigation. But they never asked the important people the important questions. Well, I went, but I went back and I figured, okay, if anybody knows where those two men are now, there's a parking garage directly behind so I went over there and I said, you know, the people who were in the building there, the maintenance, do you know, happen to know where they went to? And he said, oh, yeah, they're down on Robinson. He gave me the address. I went down there and um, I got, I found out uh, where 
um, where one of the men was, and I said, okay, he was working in another building off of 10th, and I went down there, and he wasn't there, and I left a message and uh, that I'd like to talk to him, and they got him on the phone, and I said, could I make an appointment with you? And he said yes, and um, so I, I came the next day to meet him, and um, to have coffee, and I, I told him why I wanted to meet him. I said, I have identified someone, and they say that you're the person I'm identifying, and that it's not Gary Hunt. I said, and I need to see you, because if that's true, then I want to know. Uh, so um, I went over, I met him, I walked into his office, and I looked at him, I said, thank God, you are not the man that I saw. Then he told me that there were three other sets of people. The FBI told him they had three other sets of people who were identified that looked like them, that weren't them. And I thought how very typical they were because in the two men that I saw, Gary Hunt and the other gentleman, uh, he had been, um, they were both carrying uh, satellite telephones. And when they came out on the screen, on the TV, they were dressed in civilian clothes. They were, they were going across and talking on that. They were not dressed like they were in the building. That was yeah, not Jane had actually seen them in one of the news clips. Uh, one of the early uh, cameras caught uh, these two gentlemen leaving the, the, the scene immediately after the bombing. Yes. And she identified him as the person that she saw in the building that day with the sat phone. Yes. And it, it's, you know, it is important. It's, um, uh, I know that, uh, the other, the other, you know, when I tried to to I get pictures so I could identify them and all of that, nobody, and in fact, one of the attorneys said, well, I'll get the, the police starters down here. He's, he's wonderful. He will do a good job. I said, fine, you know, never heard from him again. Boy, that was the end of that. That discussion was, that was over. The district attorney, I wrote him, told him I'd like to, I would like to appear before the grand jury. Since I saw these people, I wanted to testify about it. And I got a letter back from him telling me that they were not interested in hearing my testimony as an eyewitness. Um, they couldn't be bothered. Yeah, any, any story that, that contradicted the official story, they didn't want it included. And uh, what's interesting about the uh, multi-county grand jury that the Oklahoma Bombing Investigation yeah. Committee got impaneled uh, was that they actually turned the grand jury over to uh, the, their enemy, Bob Macy, the mm -hmm. district attorney, and he in, it proceeded to investigate the Oklahoma Bombing Investigation Committee right. as opposed to actually using it the, as the way that the will of the people were to, uh, when they impaneled the grand jury, was to investigate the bombing. And Charles Key, they told they got him off of the committee. He was head of it because he was asking questions and he wanted answers. They would not let him do that. Yeah. And that's what the grand jury is for. And um, you know, it's um, uh, these are really well staged, well staged events. And if you watch just from past history, what is happening right now today? Uh, you watch, and between uh, now you're hearing more and more about, you know, our men over there, they're going to bring them home, then they're not going to bring them home, well, maybe a later date. Then they talk about, uh, we're getting now into bombs, wars, maybe we'll do this. And you watch before the election. We're going, there's going to be something that's going to be big, which will occur. I, I just would bet my life on it, that it will occur, that somehow they will have an excuse either for uh, the Army, the National Guard, the Army to come out, you know, to supposedly protect all the people here, um, to control our, control our streets, um, to take away more of our rights for our own protection. A friend of mine and also another person, Debbie Nakanashi, uh, worked for the uh, for the um, U.S. 
post office. She was intimidated. She, you know, she saw what went on outside with the, the um, uh, bomb squad and everything. And she was told by her employer that if she spoke about it or talked about what she saw, she would be fired. I told her immediately to go to the union. They, she did, and then they came in, and then the boss came back, and then an attorney came back from the telephone company and said, well, you know, post office, you don't have to, you know, you're not going to lose your job. But, I mean, well, she, she was, was one of uh, many witnesses that saw the bomb squad uh, across the street yes. uh, at yes. the uh, uh, courthouse prior to the bombing that morning. And when she tries to speak out about it, uh, her job is threatened um, and she's yes. told to be silent. Yes, yes. And, uh, and... You know, when I went, uh, Debbie Nak Nakanashi and I went up to Washington several times, we tried to get the politicians in Washington, the senators and congressmen, to talk to us about the bombing. Not one person there would talk to either one of us. The only person who talked to us was uh, the representative from uh, Ohio. And he subpoenaed trafficant. trafficant. He subpoenaed the records from GSA. And when we went down there, we met. He was in the office and his assistant, and talked to him about you know what was going on. And the assistant had told it very interesting that FBI had called and told him they wanted he could not open one of those boxes until they had sent people down there to redraft. Re to redact, redact, all, redact all the information. And he said, no. He says, that's beyond your authority. I will allow one person to come down and do what they can do, and that's it. And he said that one end of man, I believe it was a gentleman, came down. He was doing that. And they were, he was told, we will get you for this. You, and they did. I mean, it's they obvious. Did. They, they, they really took him did. down with they, a, a they scandal. Did. Yeah, they really did. And it wasn't like he was the only person who's created a scandal. My God, look at the felons that are exactly. in Congress right now. Don't tell me about scandals. You know, look at what's going on right now in our government. That's scandal. Exactly. So, I mean, he wasn't the only individual. And I'm not saying it's a Democrat or Republican. Both have the problem. Mm -hmm. But uh, it is a real concern. Uh, uh, Charles Key. You know, he's had his share of problems. Um, Terrence Shakey, I met Terrence. I knew him. I knew his ex-wife. When, when he was having the problems, uh, when, he was, when he had reviewed uh, his report and turned in his first report at the police department to his supervisor, he was told to take it right back, cut it down. He didn't want all that information in there. Terrence refused. He rewrote it, but he refused to do what he said. He was taking a copy of that out. He talked to his wife and told her he, he was concerned for his life. He was concerned for his family, family too, and a lot yes, of his efforts to his protect two, his family. Two, two children he had, mm -hmm. and they were supposed to leave the, I believe the night that he was murdered, they were supposed he was supposed to come back and take them down to Texas. They were going to, I believe, get remarried. Yeah, see, he had reconciled with the children. Yeah, right. with the he had children. reconciled with his wife. Yeah. He had gotten a promotion. He was getting the key to the city. Right. He had everything to live for, and he, and his death was declared a suicide. Uh, now, the the parameters around that is that uh, he had supposedly cut his wrist in his car, uh, cut his neck. And then I guess tied Arms. a rope around his neck, uh, handcuff marks, and dragged himself a mile away out to, into a field and then shot himself with a small caliber weapon at a downward angle through the top of his head. It came out his jaw far enough away that uh, it didn't leave powder residue uh, on his head. And then uh, the sheriff's department, when they do arrive, uh, they, they do a thorough search of the area. They cannot find the weapon uh, because it was federal property when the FBI lands. Uh, they, they, oh, here's the weapon. They immediately go and find it. The sheriff's department had also reported that there were two boxes of documents in the back of his car. Uh, and then whenever it gets to the impound lot, uh, it's not actually part of the uh, inventory. Well, also, he had left his video camera at his home. And right after that, uh, the police department comes to her home, uh, Terry's wife's home, and bursts in. No knock, no nothing, just barges in, goes directly, where is the camera, where is everything? She said, where's your warrant? They went in, they searched everything, took everything that they wanted, and walked out with it. And that had a lot of evidence, I'm sure, on it. 
Yeah, I mean, and he, he died with nothing. They left him nothing. They gave him nothing, you know. And they call this, you know, that uh, he should have had been able to have a pension and do mm-hmm. for that. They didn't even have the courtesy to call and do those things. And every police officer that dies in Oklahoma City gets an autopsy. Uh, Terrence Shakey did not get one. Uh, they didn't ask his family if he had ever had suicidal uh, comments or thoughts. And when they question the the uh, suicide, uh, they say, oh, you watch too much television. Uh, you're, you're, you're acting crazy. You need to go back home and stop worrying about it. And this is not a way to treat a hero that saved eight people's lives that day. Well, he also, Terry also had, um, uh, Terry's wife said that he, she had a call from one of the police men that he worked with that he had talked to Terry the day before and he said the feds were after him mm-hmm. he, they were following him and uh, he said I've been told that I, I cannot tell you that I know he was in fact murdered by them because they've already told us if any of us talk we're dead our families are dead that was not an uncommon thing to be intimidated by everybody down the line uh, did you know Don Browning? I yes, I knew him okay. not well, and Don knew Don knew things that were going on, you know, and he, you know, he talked about them, you know, he would he would talk with VC, you know, he would meet with people, he would talk to things, you know, talk to people about what was happening, and um, uh, but they didn't want they didn't want to hear it, you know. It's just like thank God that when Carol Howe went. To uh, before the court, and her her supervisor, you know, they had made her out to be a liar, and she was crazy. And when then when her supervisor got on the stand, and she said, you know, she was under oath. She said what she said was absolutely the truth. Surely more people out there have morals to stand up for what everybody in World War One and World War Two stood for. The military today, they go, you know. The military today go over there to areas where this is a political war. This isn't war against the United States. It's a political war. And they sacrifice their lives, their family life, their homes, their the injuries that they sustain. They give their lives for this so that people could have freedom. And yet when they kill someone over there, they're made to come back and account for their action. It doesn't matter if you've got a bad psychological day over there. You're on your second or third tour. You you can't have, you know, a breakdown and kill people. That's against the law. You're coming back and going to be court-martialed or you're going to have a get killed, you know, or dishonorable discharge. That's wrong. Somebody in this government and somebody in Congress needs to step up and both sides of the file say, this is enough we've had going on. We need to get it taken care of. You know, we need to protect our boys. Bring them home. Absolutely. You know? I just have to say, this has been an amazing interview. And like I said, one of the most important I've ever done. It's real. Jane, my heart just aches with pain for the children that died, the friends you lost. But it also is buoyed and swells with pride at the honor and the courage you've had and the courage of the makers of a noble lie, and Terrence Yakey, who spoke out, and they tortured, murdered, last call to his partner, the feds are behind me, they're pulling me over. They tortured him pretty bad to try to find out where the documents were. The police officers that have been threatened, others that have been killed. I've been death threatened over this. I know you've had a lot of stuff go on, James. This is real. People need to know, this is real, and I want to commend and thank you both. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Ladies and gentlemen, that's it for this edition of InfoWars Nightly News. Uh, this, this, this interview needs to be seen by 10 million people. But it's up to you to send it to your Facebook, your Twitter list, everybody. I'm not risking my life for nothing. I've studied history. I know we can defeat these people if we stand up against them and have courage. Because you notice these staged attacks get bigger. First World Trade Center, FBI cooked the bomb, trained the drivers. Thank God it didn't bring down the tower. Then Oklahoma City. Then 9-11. Now they're talking about nukes going off. They detonate a nuke, they're really going to get martial law in place. This is about a bunch of hardcore crooks who compete with each other to see who's the most nastiest uh, taking control of our society. And you look at your children, you got to realize they have no future if we don't say no to this right now. I wish most men in this country had one-tenth the courage of the lady we just interviewed. I wish that men would stand up 
for honor and the truth. Because when you don't stand up against evil, it takes over and runs rampant. So shame on the men of America for being a bunch of mindless sports fans and not standing up and speaking out against this lie. They're going to use the lies of stage terror to wreck our society and take over our world if you don't do something about it. The fight is happening now. The war is now. Will you answer that call and defend the republic? It's up to you. Please get the film. It's available at infowars.com. Get it out to people. A noble lie. The only modern, well done, professionally produced film exposing this criminal conspiracy to set up a police state in America in the name of fighting terrorism that the mega banks who stage the terror attacks are actually uh, involved in. They are using their own Reichstag events, their own false flags, their own self-inflicted wounds to bring in this tyranny and pose as our saviors. So please get the film out to everybody. I'm Alex Jones signing off from the front lines of the Info War. Until next time, Lord willing.